to God be the glory. When I was a child, there was a passage of scripture my mother would quote to me, and you may have heard it in your life. It's found in Numbers chapter 23, verse 32. Be sure your sins will find you out. My mother was an excellent cook. And so she would make these chocolate chip cookies. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of chocolate chip cookies, but when they come right out of the oven and they're still so hot, they will just about burn your tongue. They'll melt down over your thumb and finger and you can eat them. And it's like a little piece of heaven. I've often wished that somewhere in heaven, they'll have chocolate chip cookies. They just don't have any calories there. I, I thought it would be great, but my mother would make these for everybody. If they were uh, having a baby, if somebody had recently lost somebody, she would make chocolate chip cookies to bring over to them. And she would always make a batch for us as well. But I can remember on at least a few occasions, my mother would make those and then have to go to the store to get some more supplies. And she would say, Bill, stay out of the chocolate chip cookies. Well, I would try, but it's sort of like an addict when he has the drugs right there in front of him. I would see those cookies, I would pass them by and I would say, no, no. And finally, I would think, well, if I just take one, I can rearrange the rest of the cookies and then it'll be okay. And I would eat one. And then I would eat another, rearrange the cookies, eat another, rearrange the cookies. When my mother would come in from the store, she didn't even have to go into the kitchen. She would look at me and she would say, you've been in the cookies, haven't you? And I would say, how do you know? And she would say, be sure your sins will find you out. Well, that passage does mean that your sins will find you out. But if you look at Numbers, tw or Numbers 23, you're going to find out that the thought that he had in mind here isn't primarily about doing something you shouldn't do. We'll look at that in a moment. But I will say, yes, be sure your sins will find you out. No matter what you're doing in life, God's always watching. No matter what you're doing in life, you're responsible for what you do. And be sure your sins will find you out. Somebody says, I don't even know what sin is. I don't, I don't think people actually sin. Well, if you define sin the way the Bible does, everybody sins. You know this. The Bible says, whosoever goes onward and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. It's a transgression. When God said stop, when you should have stopped, you went further than that. The Bible calls that sin. Also, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means being less than we should be. There are things in your life you've done that you should not have done. And there are times in your life that you have not done what you should have done, where you've been less than you should have been. You know the Bible calls that sin? Be sure your sins will find you out. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Again, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The terrible thing is that the wages of sin is death. So be sure your sins will find you out. I want to go back, though, to the context of where that passage was originally given. And I want you to start with me in verse 1 of Numbers chapter 23. And then I want you to listen to what he has to say. He says, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that it was a place for livestock, they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation and said, Adaroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eleela, uh, Shebam, Beon, and Nebo, the land that the Lord drove out before the children of Israel. The congregation of Israel is a place for livestock. And see, we have livestock. If therefore we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to us for a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. The NIV says, do not make us go over the Jordan. Now, the reason this is important to me, and I want you to think about what this means, is that for hundreds and hundreds of years, the children of Israel have dreamed about what happens just over the Jordan. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, God made him a promise that this land would be given to them. And it had been hundreds of years since that promise. Since that time, they had gone down into Egypt and gone from being honored guests to being abject slaves in Egypt. For hundreds of years, they've been dreaming about, praying for, hoping for this great land of promise. 
God sends Moses, 10 plagues, releases the people from Egypt. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. An entire generation of people dies in that wilderness. And now they finally come just to the edge of the land of promise. They are on the east side of the Jordan River looking west. And just across that river is everything they've been hoping for, everything they've been praying for. And now Reuben and Gad say, don't make us go over there. Why in the world would that be the case? After all the dreams, after all the hopes, why now would they not want to go over? Can I tell you that some of the reasons they don't want to go over is the reason that you and I don't want to cross our rivers? Without getting too far out of bounds, let me just say to you that everybody that I am talking to right now has a river to cross. Everybody has a river to cross. Your river and my river may be somewhat different, but we have a river to cross. For the children of Gad and the children of Israel in general, it was crossing over that river to conquer the promised land. For you and I, it may be something different. Some of you have habits in your life that desperately need to change. That's your river. You need to do something about that. Some of you are not spending enough time with your family to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Your business and your work have taken you away and you're so involved in that and so caught up in that that you've forgotten how important your family is. Your river to cross is getting connected to your family again. For some of you, it's the habit of bad language. You've been using language that you know is not acceptable to God, maybe to fit in, maybe for a lot of other reasons. Your river to cross is to change that and to clean up your speech. For some of you, that river that you need to cross is probably the river of getting back into the Word, getting back into prayer again. That for a long time, you've not really been reading the gospel. For a long time, you've not really been spending time with God in prayer. And you need to reconnect. That's your river that you need to cross. For some of you, you may have, as a child of God, wandered away from Him and you need to come home. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. James chapter 5, verse 16. You need to confess that and change your life. That's your river. And for some of you who are watching right now, your river is that you need to be right with God and you've never been right with God. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 tells us that the Lord's arm is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God and your iniquities have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. You're separated because of sin. There's a cure for that and his name is Jesus and you need to come back to him. You come back to Jesus in what way? He said, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Without faith, it's impossible to be well-pleasing to God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Repent from your sin. It's the hardest thing you'll ever be called upon to do, and yet that's what God does demand of you, to repent from sin. What does that mean? It means a change, basically a change that takes place in your spirit, a change that takes place in your heart. Before I was fighting against God, now I have surrendered to God. Before I was in rebellion to God, now I'm obedient to God. I have decided to be a part of what God wants. What I wanted is not as important to me now as what God wants. That's repentance. It's hard to do. And yet God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. So I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I want to follow Him in my life. What do I need to do? Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Will you confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart and what you've decided to do? And that is, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it's something you don't just do before baptism. It's something you do for your entire life. And having done that, will you be baptized for the remission of sins? Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Theologians, philosophers, preachers, and a lot of other folks will tell you, you don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. I would take all of those people and put them over here and put Jesus over here. Who are you going to listen to? And who are you going to trust? 
I will put my trust in Jesus, not in philosophers, not in preachers, in Jesus. He's the one who died, and he's the one who said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That may be the river that you need to cross right now. Well, what's keeping you from crossing that river? Maybe it's some of the same things that kept the children of Israel, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben from wanting to cross that river as well. Look back at verse 1 of chapter 23, the book of Numbers. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. Just stop right there. One of the problems that some of us have is the stuff we have around us, that things get in the way, that we forget that things can't bring us salvation. Things can't make us right with God. They had a very great multitude of livestock. Years ago in California, a man was driving home from work one afternoon when he saw fire trucks on his street. And then to his horror, he realized that that was his house that was on fire. Now, there were some things in that house that were precious to him. And so he got out of his car. He ran into the house to try to rescue them. And while he was there, the roof collapsed and he died, burned up in that house. They were interviewing his grieving widow on the news later that day. And she said this that I'll never forget. There was nothing in that house worth burning up for. I want to tell you something. There is nothing in this world worth burning up for. Not one thing. Don't let possessions get in the way. We have become people who believe that somehow happiness depends upon stuff. Do you remember what Jesus said when he said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses? It's an equation here that things do not equal life. And life does not equal things. Don't let your stuff get in the way of crossing the river you need to cross. That was the first thing that they said. But if you skip down a little bit further, I want you to go down to verse 5. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, don't make us go across this river. If we found favor in your sight. What does that mean? Well, it means this. Haven't we done enough? You know, I see people in the church every once in a while say, I used to be a Bible class teacher. I used to be an elder. I used to be a preacher. I, I used to study my Bible all the time. I used to pray as though God was in the room. I used to do that. But are you doing it now? Have you done enough? I hear people that are not part of the body of Christ who say, you know what? I'm good to my fellow man. I have, I have spent my life in sacrifice for people that I, I do a lot of good things. I share of my stuff. I obey the law. I, I, I try to be a good citizen. Haven't I done enough? And the answer to that is no, you're not done. You're not done. And by the way, all the good things that you can do if you're not a child of God, they're not enough. The Bible says in Isaiah, our righteousness is like filthy rags. The best we do is not enough. No, I'm not done yet. If I have to define my spiritual life in used to's, that I used to be this, I used to do that, I need to change. I see older people saying it's time to let younger people serve. Well, it is time to let younger people serve. That doesn't mean that it's time for you to stop. Marshall Keeble was probably one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. In his lifetime, he baptized 40,000 people. When he became older, he developed a heart condition. And the doctor told him, he said, Brother Keeble, he said, you're going to have to slow down. You're not going to be able to do what you've been doing. And I love his response. He said, when God wants me to stop, he will let me know. When God wants you to stop, he will let you know. And that day will come when he calls you home. Until then, don't stop. Don't let up. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't let down. Whatever you do, you serve God every single day. No, we have not done enough. And no, we've not been good enough. If it's not for the grace of God and the mission of God, you and I would absolutely be lost. We haven't done enough. So how does Moses respond to this? Now I have to tell you that I'm pretty much in awe of the children of Reuben and the children of Gad who come to Moses and say, we don't really want to go over the river. 
You know why? Because Moses is the guy, when he came down off the mountain of God, when the children of Israel were sinning and worshiping a golden calf, he took that golden calf and he ground it up and made them drink it. He's the guy who saw to it that the ground opened up and swallowed the rebellious. I think I would have sent him a letter. I don't think I would have showed up to tell Moses at all. And yet they did. They did show up. So how does Moses respond? I want you to look at verse 6. Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Did you know that in the world in general, most people aren't doing right? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Strive to enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in that way. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Most people are headed in the wrong direction. If you are trying to follow most people, you're going to head in the wrong direction. Most people in any congregation of the Lord's people are not working. Only the minority are working and the rest are somewhat coasting. It reminds me of the two guys on a bicycle built for two who are pedaling up a hill. When they get to the top, the one in the front says, that hill was steeper than I thought. The one in the back said, it sure was. If I hadn't been riding the brakes all the way up, we would have gone backwards. You're either pedaling or you're riding the brakes. If you're not with me, you're against me, Jesus says. This is important. Are you with him or against him? Shall you sit here while your brothers go to war? God has a work that needs to be done in our time. God has a mission for your life. He has a purpose for you individually. He knows something he wants you to do personally in life. And we're missing it if we're thinking life is just about us. We're missing it if we're thinking life is just about ease. It's not easy going to war. But the alternative is, that we sit while other people do the work of God. But listen a little further as he talks in verse seven. Why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over to the land that God is giving them? You don't just stay neutral. You're either helping or you're hurting. You're either encouraging or you're discouraging. You're either involved or you're keeping other people from being involved. I want you to imagine what this must have been like for the children of Israel if they were going to go over. Here's here's a group of mamas who are kissing their sons goodbye. There are wives who are saying goodbye to their husbands, maybe for the very last time because they're going to be going to war. There are children who are holding on to their daddy's legs and begging them not to go. And yet, because they are children of God and because God intends for them to cross that river and conquer the land on the other side, they're going. Now, I want you to imagine that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad are sitting in their tents with their mamas and with their wives and with their children, and they're looking at these guys and say, y'all have a nice war while we sit over here. It's a discouragement. For the people who are trying to do right, when you're not interested in doing right, it's a discouragement. When people are sacrificing for a greater good, and you, on the other hand, are simply gathering to yourself, it's a discouragement to the people who are sacrificing that you're doing what you're doing. You're either actively involved in helping or you are actively involved in hurting. And there's really not a middle ground. Life is not just about you. You cannot escape your influence any more than you can escape your shadow in the noonday sun. The fact is, everything you do affects somebody else. And so he says, you're discouraging. If you're not going over, You're discouraging. He then went on to talk about what their fathers had done. He talked about how their fathers had had discouraged and been disobedient and sometimes absolutely rebellious. And as a result of that, they fell in the wilderness. And then he says this in verse 14, look, you have risen in your father's place. And he meant it in a bad way. He said, you're doing the same thing that your fathers did. And and think about it. He said, they were a brood of sinful men. He said, you're just like them. But I want to take that phrase and, and bring it a little out of context for a moment and just say, you have risen in your father's place. The fact is that they were following the same pattern that their forefathers had followed, and that was getting them in trouble. On the other hand, you were risen in our Father's place. Some of you are a part of a congregation of people. 
I want you to think about the fact that you were there because somebody else sacrificed to make that happen. Some of you were Christians. Why are you Christians? You're Christians because someone ahead of you took the time and made the sacrifice and cared enough about you that they shared with you the message of Christ. What are you going to do to be worthy of that? I preach a lot of funerals. In those funerals, people want really wonderful things said about the folks who have passed away. And they believe that somehow or another that they're honoring the person who passed away by talking about all the good things that that person had done. But I want you to know that the honor that comes to them is the honor that comes when you live a life that's worthy of them, when you live a life that's worthy of sacrifice, when you live a life that makes their life meaningful and worthwhile. The greatest tribute that I can give to a person of faith is to live in faith. The greatest honor that I can give to someone who loves is to love like they did. You and I have been risen up in our Father's place for a reason. And that reason is to do good. Now, they heard his message. They heard the threat in the message. And so the children of Reuben and the children of Gad changed their heart. Listen to begin at ver beginning at verse 16. Then they came near to him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. Here's what they said. They said, not only will we cross that river, we'll be the first one to cross. We will go before them. We will fight in the forefront. We're going to take care of our families here, but we're going to fight. That's what we're going to do. We will not quit fighting. In fact, look at the next thing that they said. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. That's verse 18. They're saying, we won't come back till this battle is over. They're going to cross that river and they're going to fight until everybody gets their inheritance. Your life is not over until it's over. Don't stop living before you die. Keep living. Keep striving. Keep working. Keep dreaming. Keep doing. All the way until the Lord calls you home because the battle's not over till it's over. Don't lay down and surrender right at the point where you could win. You have the opportunity to do something more. Now listen to Moses' response beginning in verse 20. Then Moses said to them, If you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for war, and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord. And I'm going to read the next in a minute, but I want you to notice what he said in verse 20. If you do this thing, Living for God is not just something you believe, it's something you do. We don't just believe in the love of God, we believe in loving. We don't just believe that faith saves, we have faith. We don't just believe in sacrifice, we sacrifice. We don't just believe that giving is the right thing to do, we give. We don't just believe that God demands that all men everywhere repent, we repent. We don't just believe that baptism is for the remission of sins. We are baptized. If you do this thing, Christianity is something that you do. And if you do it, listen to what he says, afterwards you may return and be blameless before the Lord. If you live your life in service for God, you can be blameless. But what if you don't? Look at verse 23 again. But if you do not do so, then take note that you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Notice what he said, and this is the context that I began with. He didn't say, if you do something you shouldn't do, God will find out and your sin will find you out. He says, if you don't do what you should do, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. There are some things God demands that we do. He demands that we believe. He demands that we repent. He demands that we confess Him before men. He demands that we be baptized for the remission of sins. He demands that we be faithful unto death for us to receive a crown of life. When I choose not to do what I am supposed to do, I have sinned. Be sure your sin 
will find you out. Do you need to be baptized today? Be baptized today. Do you need to ask for prayer today? Don't skip that. Ask for prayer today. Are there people whose lives you need to reconnect with today? People who are separated from you because of relationship issues or something else? Do something about that starting now. Because if you don't, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't miss the opportunity to do the will of God. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Those are the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Will you do that today? I hope so.